<sighs> Hi, Stephanie. Hi, everyone who's joining. Hi, guys. Hi, Chem K underscore XXV. Hi, Anna. Hi, Zora. Thank you so much. It is my birthday today. I turned 30, so very exciting. Um, but we'll give everyone a quick second to join. Um, I'm so excited for our financial workshop session today. We are all going to be getting very, very smart. Um, we're going to be learning a lot more about finance, but I will, I'll save the real spiel for once a couple more folks go on and join us. Um, I'm so excited to be here. How's everybody's Wednesday going? Thanks for all the birthday wishes, guys. Thank you so, so much. Jay, congrats on getting into UChicago. You're going to love it if you end up going. Um, I went there. I loved it. Um, it was wonderful. Amazing. Um, my Wednesday is good. I'm here with my beautiful... <laughs> <laughs> assistant who is going to help us um, moderate some Q&A. We're going to be doing lots of cool stuff today. I'm so excited. Thank you everybody for taking some time out of your day to chat with us. Um, we are going to be having a full on TikTok live. We'll be here for a little under an hour um, and we're going to talk about everything money. So uh, please, I'm going to give everybody just one more minute and then we'll get started. Uh, ooh. Okay. Sorry. Hi besties. So good to see you. I'm so happy you guys are all here. Okay. Alrighty. Hi, Jeremiah. Hi, Jay. Hi, Jin the Jin. Hi, Jen and Atticus. I am not from Chicago, but I went to school there, so I have a really soft spot for it. I'm, I, I absolutely love Chicago. But um, I think since we are on a tight timeline, why don't we go ahead and get started Hello to all of my besties. I see you guys filling in. Um, I'm so excited to be here to chat with you today about all things money. And we are going to be celebrating Women's History Month. So Marshalls wants to make sure that women everywhere have access to the good stuff in life, including the financial tools to live the lives that they want to live. So both Marshalls and I are passionate about creating communities and spaces for women to come together to learn, grow, and achieve self-betterment. And there's no better time to do that than Women's History Month. So this month, we've heard a lot about the importance of investing in women, and it's true. When we invest in women, um, we can actually invest in ourselves. And so we get exactly what we want out of life. So today we are gonna cover some of the biggest financial takeaways and tools from my book. And then we're gonna dive into some Q&A. Um, so big thank you to all of the besties who submitted their questions on Instagram. Um, but if we have a little bit of extra time, I'll also take live questions from everybody who's tuned in. Um, but I wanna make sure that everybody here walks out with some actionable advice and tips that they can use to really empower their own lives and implement into their daily habits. And then obviously, just to say, money management is not rocket science. Um, you've just never had somebody teach you before, so I don't want anybody to think that they can't do it. So to kick us off, I'm gonna go over three big, big habits that rich people have that I would say average people like ourselves don't. Oh, whoa, I have a crown. Thank you so much for sending that. Um, there's a lot we can obviously learn from rich people and a lot that they won't tell us, but I'm going to today. And we can use this information to actually uplift our own communities and help them get rich AF. Um, because you definitely don't have to start out rich to be rich and have a rich life. And it certainly doesn't even necessarily tie to the exact dollar amount that is found in your bank account. So 
All of this is covered in my book, Rich AF. It is a one-stop shop that is going to help get you on financial track. Um, if you have any interest, if you want to learn how to ask for a raise at work and budget more effectively without hating your life and save more efficiently and faster for your goals and learn how to invest 101, um, please check it out. You can get a copy at richaf.me. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the comments or let's see, I can put a sticker up. Hold on one second. Okay, I am commenting right now. Sorry, you guys, that you're looking at my forehead while we do this. Perfect. Okay, so let us get started. So very first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about those three rich habits. So the first one, people are always kind of surprised about. Um, one, rich people are really, really lazy. Uh, first off, they want to maximize their income and get labor to be a smaller part of their take-home pay. So think about it like this. When you first start out in your career, uh, there is a circle. This is how much money you take home. And the vast majority of this circle is going to be red. And... It is going to be from stuff that you get paid from your day job or your side hustle, what have you. And then you're gonna take a little bit of that money that you get from those red activities and you are going to put that into investing. And then there's gonna be a teeny tiny sliver that is actually going to be blue. Um, and that is your income from investing. So it's mostly a red pie, then it becomes a little sliver of blue. But over time, the hope is that the blue sliver gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and the red piece actually gets smaller and smaller. So more of your money is going to be coming from your investment dollars versus the actual work you go and do day in and day out. Um, why is this important? Because we have to remember we are human beings and not only do we deserve rest, we need it. You cannot work 24 seven. You will obviously burn out. You are not going to do well. It's so important that we all have time to rest. But do you know what doesn't need to rest? Your money. Your money can work for you round the clock, 24 seven. It does not need to take a lunch break and it can be working for you while you sleep and on weekends. So this is just really important to remember that your money is a better money making tool than your body or even your mind is. And you're probably wondering, okay, you talk so much about investing, like how, how do I actually do that? How do I go about doing that? Well, the easiest thing you can do if you want to invest and you are like, I don't know where to start. I'm very confused. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Just use a robo-advisor. A robo-advisor is truly what I like to call the millennial Gen Z, but like really like the technological advanced version of investing. Um, essentially, you go to a robo-advisor brokerage and all you have to do is take a short quiz about your money goals. So things like how much money you currently have, how much money you make, how much, you know, you would like to have in retirement, what retirement looks for you. Um, and then it will essentially go beep, boop, 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 and then spit out a perfectly diversified portfolio that makes sense based on your money goals. And that's great because it means you are actually going to have a diversified portfolio. So somebody in the comments just asked, Examples of robo-advisors, I want to keep this like really neutral. Truly, the thing is, is don't get paralysis by analysis. There's no such thing as the perfect one, the best one. Go ahead and just search best robo-advisors 2024. There are going to be some really incredible like articles on nerd wallet or a bank rate that is going to outline all of the different types of robo-advisors that may make sense for you. And then you can just kind of play around with the interfaces and see which one you like the best because personal finance is really, really personal. Okay, so two, another hot rich person tip is that rich people have an abundance mindset and they love to share, swap, and scratch each other other's backs because they believe in collaboration, not competition. Um, this is something that I had never ever realized or even heard of because I grew up in a regular family. And sometimes the advice that was given to me was that, hey, 
there is only one internship. You are going to have to beat out all of these other people for that spot. And in some cases, yes, that is true. But what we have to come to realize is that we are going to go so much further collaborating with our peers versus competing against them. Um, and it also allows us to be better with our money overall. So one of the easiest things I've heard rich people say is, oh, I've got a great tax accountant. You should talk to them. Or, ha, huh, I'm a member of this country club. I can sponsor you to join. They want to help each other because this is why it's so important. When you help someone, you get a chip, essentially, a negotiation chip. And this chip you can put in your back pocket. And then the next time you need something, they will feel really, really obligated to help you. And so essentially, you're trading favors. And that is incredibly important because it's going to help you over time level up your game because there are going to be instances in your life where there's going to be an amazing job that opens up and you're not qualified. But you might have a friend who is, and you know what's awesome? You will be able to put your friend up for that job. And when you do that, you know what's going to happen? Your friend's going to interview. They're going to get that job. And once they get that job, they are going to be in a position of power to then help you out. So again, truly don't think about it as competition. It is a collaborative effort and it's so important that we are looking out for each other. Quick break. Somebody did ask, what is your book called? Rich AF. Grace, do you mind grabbing a quick copy um, so we can show everybody? Uh, But it is truly better to collaborate than compete because we are all going to go further. And the last hot tip I want to share tonight Sorry, my phone just had a low battery notice. Um, Rich people love to negotiate and they love to negotiate everything. And I mean everything from their phone bill to their medical bills to even at a clothing store. Um, A great example of this is I was shopping for a pair of black, black platform heels and I asked the associate, I was like, hey, can you help me find this in a size eight? And they brought out the shoes and I was like, oh, these are perfect. But there was a pretty tough scuff on one of the heels. And I was like, oh man, do you have a fresh pair in the back? I love these shoes, but I don't want to buy shoes with a scuff on them. And the sales associate came back and said, unfortunately, no, this is the last in the size. Like, you know, there's nothing I can really do for you. And so I thought about it and I was like, listen, I'm in a pinch. I need these shoes for tonight. So I asked, I said, hey, I love these shoes. Unfortunately, there is a scuff on them. What can you do to help me out? I'd love to get these shoes. Is there any sort of discount you could provide? I got those shoes 15% off. And I think that's really powerful because had I just not said anything, I wouldn't have gotten it. But easy enough, they offered it to me 15% off in the same way that you have to remember that they're... 80% of medical bills actually have errors in them. So before you pay that medical bill, you got to make sure you are reading it line item by line item, calling in, asking for waivers, discount relief plans, anything like that. That way you are making sure that you are paying what you should actually be paying versus overpaying. Um, I do have a quick copy so that everybody can see. This is my book, Rich AF. Um, It is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, We've sold over... 85,000 copies at this point. Um, so it is really, really a good book. I truly, well, I I say that because I wrote it, but I think it is a great roadmap blueprint. That's going to help you. If you feel like you are completely lost with your money, read this from page one to the very last page, and you'll be more ready, more confident, more capable to take on your financial journey. So now that we've hit on those three important rich people have, uh, rich people habits, shall I say, Um, let's actually move on to the part that everybody's been waiting for, the Q&A. So let's do some Q&A. Those are just three little tips from the book. If you want to learn more, you can check out a copy. Um, And I'm very, very grateful for everybody for being here. Um, And I do see we have quite a few more folks who've joined since I started um, this session. 
Uh, for everybody who just joined us, I want to thank Marshalls really quick for giving me the opportunity to talk about financial education for women um, and helping me host this session so we can all get the good stuff in our lives today and every day. Um, but now it is time for our Q&A and let's go ahead and dive into these questions. We asked these um, in the past week or two and we grabbed questions from online and Grace, my lovely assistant, is going to read them out to us and then we are going to answer them together. Okay, Grace, hit me with question number one. How much savings should I have for retirement? Okay, did you guys hear her? Wait, hold on, wait. Someone says, someone says show Grace, here. Grace, say hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, so repeat the question loud. How much savings should I have for retirement? Okay, so this is a question that folks ask all the time, but we have to remember that personal finance is personal finance for a reason. There is no perfect answer. We're going to have to do a little bit of soul searching of like how we want to live in our actual lives. Um, there is a rule of thumb. It is 10 times your annual salary at age 67. However, what I prefer to do actually is to go online and utilize something called a retirement calculator. It's going to ask you for your age, what year you'd like to retire, how many years you're from that, and then at, after the age of retirement, how many years you plan on surviving or living. Um, you're gonna be able to basically put in a bunch of factors and then it'll break down exactly how much you'll need. And some of those calculators are really, really helpful because you can input how much you have currently and then it'll tell you how much you're gonna be needing to set aside every single month to actually hit that goal. But a really good soul searching exercise is to close your eyes and think about your perfect retirement. Where do you want to live? Do you want to live in your current town? Do you want to retire to the beaches of, you know, Naples, Florida? Do you want to retire to Naples, Italy? The answers to that can be yours, but the numbers are going to be different. And whatever that number might be, you're going to then track back to how much money you're going to need to actually live that life. Awesome. Okay. Grace, hit me with question number two. How can I better plan for the unexpected? Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so I don't know how many of you guys know this, but on my 25th birthday, I accidentally had to go to the ER because I had a little snafu with my finger and a bread knife. And I went to the ER and I had good insurance at the time, but I ended up having an emergency room bill that was $16,000. And after insurance, I still owed 1,300 on it. And it was so expensive and it felt like an insurmountable amount of money. So what I always say is to prepare for the unexpected and the unfortunate, make sure that you have an emergency fund. If you are a singleton, uh, basically you're just worried about yourself, uh, I would say three to six months of living expenses is probably good. If you have inconsistent income, so you, you know, are a freelancer like myself, or you're a head of household, you're a parent, people rely on you, you're gonna want closer to six to 12 months of your living expenses set aside as well. Um, what I say is take that money and put it into a high yield savings account. And I did see our friend, Lady Mo, ask what's the best high yield savings account? The best one is the one that you'll actually use. Uh, frankly, I'll, I have no hard feelings of like, you must use this high yield savings account. But what I don't want to happen is you say, hey, I need to spend this weekend and research all of the different high yield savings accounts and then pick the perfect one. And then you are so intimidated, you don't do it. And you don't do it this weekend. And you don't do it next weekend. And you don't do it a month from now. And then you don't do it a year from now. And now you've missed out on an entire year of interest that you could have earned. So what I say is high yield savings accounts right now should be offering you anywhere between four and a half to five, five and a half ish percent in APY. And that is so much better than the FDIC national average of 0.46%, which is what you get offered at a traditional brick and mortar bank. So easily just pick one. It's going to be 10 X what you're currently earning. And that is going to help. Okay. Grace hit me with the next one. 
What is the best way to invest my money? Okay. Do not let people fool you. It is not by cherry picking the best stock. I promise you. I promise you. Think about it like this. When you go to the the candy store, what is it called? The like a drugstore, and you are shopping for Halloween and you buy an entire bag of Snickers, okay? You put them out and you're ready for Halloween. Then a kid with a peanut allergy comes to your house. The kid's now disappointed and your house might, might get egged. However, what you should do is instead buy a big bag of Halloween candy that's completely mixed up. It's got some of the chocolates, it's got some of the fruities, it's got some of the gummies, what have you. You put it all out. And no matter who it is, no matter what kid comes to your door, you are going to have something for them. And that is the exact same way I think about investing. When you try to cherry pick single stocks, odds are good you're going to be exposed to a lot of risk because if anything happens to that company, you could see your investment dip significantly. However, when you invest in index funds, these are ones that track things like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ you are essentially buying a basket of stocks, a basket of investments. So instead of buying one thing, you can buy a basket of a whole bunch of stuff. And this allows you to participate in all of the upward movement as well as protects you from some of that downward movement if something were to happen to one of the companies or two of the companies. And that way, you're just able to have a easier and smoother investing journey because it's not about checking your profile every single day and feeling that anxiousness of, oh, my investments are up, my investments are down. No, investing should actually be really, really boring. And no one likes to hear that. But when your investments are boring, it allows you to really focus on the long term, the the long con, which is I want to make sure that my money grows over time. Okay, next question. How do I finance a big purchase? Ooh, okay. Okay. This is a very good one. Um, I love a sinking fund. So with a sinking fund, essentially what you do is you think about what you want to buy. So I'll give an example. Say I want to go to Marshall's and I see that they have an amazing designer bag. It is high end, high end, and it's a thousand dollars. When I see that, I'm going to be like, okay, I want to set aside a thousand dollars for this bag. Taking $1,000 out of my bank account feels like a lot. However, what you can do instead is say, hey, I am going to save for this bag over 10 weeks, 20 weeks, what have you. And then I divide up that $1,000 and you can basically break up that payment over time in your head. And you can essentially put that money into a separate high yield savings account, earn interest on it and set aside $50 a week, $100 a week. And that way you are able to make sure that you have the money for that thing that you've been saving for and that you're really excited about, but you're also not putting yourself in a tough financial position to actually get that thing. Um, Another good example is a home down payment. If you are interested in buying a home, like we have to think about, hey, how much is that home gonna be gonna cost? How much is the down payment I wanna put down? What are those closing costs? And you have a number in your head. And now you're thinking, okay, I have that number in my head. I'm going to split it up over time. I'm going to be able to save for that down payment over the course of two years and then slowly start setting money aside every single week. And since it's a smaller increment, it's going to feel a lot less intimidating. Okay. Thoughts on a high-yield savings account? Mm. How can I choose a bank account for my high-yield savings account? Yeah. Okay, so I already answered this question, but this is one that's very popular, so I can do it again because I know there are quite a few, you know, every time I check, there seems to be an extra 150 people in this. Um, So for your high-yield savings account, uh, what you want to do is literally just search best high-yield savings accounts 2024. You will find articles from very reputable sources. And then you will look at all of the different high yield savings accounts and see which ones you'll go to their sites. You'll play around on their interfaces, see which ones you are most comfortable with and then pick one. That's it. 
It's that easy. When you put your money in, you are going to be able to earn significantly more interest. So I'll give you the exact math example. With a traditional brick and mortar bank that you would go to on the corner, when you put $100 into the account at the end of the year, per the FDIC national savings account average, you would have $100.46. What am I doing with 46 cents? I can't buy anything with 46 cents. But with a high yield savings account, you put in $100. And at the end of the year, based on the averages of what high yield savings accounts are currently offering, you'll have anywhere between $104.50 all the way to $105.50. Listen, saving your money is not going to help it grow as much as investing. But for your emergency fund, you 1000% should have a high yield savings account and be setting money aside in an account like that to help you earn money and grow it while it's just sitting aside waiting for your rainy day. What is your recommended savings breakdown for each month? Ooh, okay. So I would say there's not a recommended savings breakdown per se, but there is an easy way that I like to budget the money coming in. So think less about the document you sign when you sign up for your job, but more so what you actually see coming into your checking account or your bank account every single month. What is your take home pay? Now of your take home pay, you want to split it into three different categories. 50% half of your take home pay is going to go into needs. So this is things like paying your rent, getting groceries, paying for utilities, any sort of insurance that you have to pay for, maybe for your transportation, things like that. 30% goes into wants. This is hitting up the nail salon, grabbing a drink with a friend, or seeing a concert. And then 20% goes into taking care of future you. So this is the saving debt and investment portion of your 50, 30, 20 budget. And what I like to say is there are three steps here. First, you need to make sure you have saved up your emergency fund. This is going to be three to six months of living expenses if you're a singleton or six to 12 if you're a head of household, have unstable income or have dependents. Then once your emergency fund is done, you are going to take that money from that 20% of that savings portion and put it towards high interest debt. So this is typically credit card debt. Um, any debt above 7% is considered high interest. Pay that down. Basically, you're going to make the minimum payment across all of your debt, but put any additional funds towards the highest amount of debt. Then once you have done that and you're kind of moving on to your lower interest rate debt, you can kind of put that on the back burner. Just continue to make the minimum payment and any additional dollars can go towards your investing. The beauty here is, again, personal finance is personal. What you can do is once you have your emergency fund and you're starting to pay down your debt and you're considering about investing, if you have other goals that you want to save for, you can set money aside for that. So maybe that's a down payment on a car or a home. Maybe you just want to treat yourself to a new laptop or you need to move into a new apartment and you have to rent, you have to get new furniture for your apartment. Anything that makes sense for your life, you can save, but just utilize that 20% for that savings, debt, pay down, and investing. Is it better to be out of debt first and then start investing? So we just talked about this a little bit. Um, not always. When it comes to paying down debt or investing, you want to consider the interest rate. So when you look at the interest rates for certain types of debt, you're going to notice that they are in a rank. Think about this like um, one of those cool jelly lamps where like the most viscous material is at the bottom. So you, the highest interest rate debt is at the top. This is typically credit card debt. This is 20 to 25%. Then you've got things like personal loan debt, car loans, then below that, typically mortgages, then below that. If you graduated college around when I graduated, which was 2016, um, and you got a federal student loan, you could have gotten something with like a three or 4% handle on it. So it's even below that. So it's less, you know, less scary, less growy debt at the bottom, more scary, more growy debt at the top. And what you want to do is demark where 7% is. That is the break even. Any debt above 7%, you're going to make the minimum payment on everything, but you are going to try and put any additional funds towards
towards that high interest rate debt. Then what you're going to do is that after you get to that 7% level, you are going to just make the minimum payment on the debt down here. And then you can start investing while paying off your debt because your investments can likely earn you more in the S&P 500, just investing in the total stock market, then you would actually save paying off your debt earlier. Should I set up a Roth IRA for my teen kids or is there a better investment path to take advantage of? Ooh, okay. So a custodial Roth IRA is a wonderful account to utilize for your kids. Um, essentially, it's a Roth IRA, but for someone who is a minor. Um, one thing that parents should keep in mind though is that with a custodial Roth IRA kiddo does have to have earned income so they've got to be tutoring or babysitting or mowing lawns or maybe you know you're a mommy blogger someone just said what was the question the question was should you set up a Roth IRA for my should I set up a Roth IRA for my teen kids or is there a better investment path to take advantage of so what I was saying is that with a custodial Roth IRA you have to actually have your kid earning money. It can't just be money you give them. Um, and as they're earning this money, you can help them set it aside into that account. Um, and then that account will be able to grow tax-free and then they'll be able to access it um, uh, tax-free. This is important to call out. This isn't a situation where, ooh, okay, for everybody who is attempting to join my live, like become another person on the screen. Can you please stop doing that? <laughs> it's, it, it keeps popping up. It's a little distracting. Um, but, uh, essentially this is just going to let you set money aside for your kiddos retirement, but they do have to have earned income. Other options are that you can open up a UGMA or a UTMA account, UGMA or UTMA, if you want to learn a little bit more. Um, and it's essentially, it stands for a uniform transfer act for minors act. Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. Um, and you are able to then set aside things for your kids for the future for them. And they don't necessarily have to have that earned income. It's just another option. Um, as well as if the reason you're trying to help your kids save is for education, you could consider a 529 account. Um, it is a investment account specifically set aside for educational costs. You essentially open one up and you start putting money in. And you can take money out for your kiddo when they need it for a private school or for secondary education. Is it how to approach investing late in life? Mm, okay, yeah, this is a great question. Also, for everybody who are asking questions in the comments, I'm going to wrap up these pre, pre-submitted questions and then I'll take a couple from the audience. Um, so the how to approach investing later in life if you're in your 50s or 60s, um, please just remember this. I think people get really overwhelmed and they think, oh, I'm not 20, investing isn't gonna work for me. That's not true. Is it easier if you start it when you're 20? Of course, time is on your side. But the best day to start investing was yesterday and the second best day is today. So when you are in your 50s, remember that there is something called a catch-up contribution. And what that means is when it comes to your employer-sponsored retirement plan, like your 401k or your 403b at work, or your Roth IRA or, or your IRA personal individual retirement account, you can actually contribute more when you are in your 50s, when you're closer to retirement, than you would in your 40s, your 30s, or your 20s. You actually can contribute up to an additional $1,000 every single year month for your IRA and your Roth IRA. And that's going to help you essentially catch up. They're literally called catch up contributions. Um, so at a point in your fifties or sixties, odds are good. You're probably at the peak of your career. Um, you are much more senior. You're making more money than you probably were in your twenties. So now that you have more money, you can actually contribute more towards those saving and retirement goals. You are going to have to contribute a little bit more money than had you started in your 20s, but it is certainly still doable and I highly recommend it. Is it smarter to invest when the market is high or when the market is low? Why? Mm, okay, so is it better to invest when the market is high or when the market is low? Okay, I don't know about you, but I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. I don't. If I had a crystal ball, I would already be retired in Bora Bora. I'm sorry. 
But nobody knows if the market is high or low unless they're looking historically. They're looking retroactively. And obviously, hindsight is always 2020. So what I say is you're never going to know if something is high or low. What you should do instead is be consistent. Um, Something that I recommend is dollar cost averaging. So this is where you put your investment dollars as a set amount every single month and you say, okay, in January, I'm going to invest $100. In February, I'm going to invest $100. In March, I'm going to invest $100. All through the year. What naturally happens is if you set a dollar amount and not a certain number of shares of anything, when the prices of certain investments are higher, you will buy fewer of them. And when they're lower, you'll buy more of them. And over time, that will mean you will over time get a better price. You will get a more averaged out price. So you don't have to time the market. You don't have to perfectly buy when the the market is at the bottom. We never know when that is. But being consistent over time, setting aside a fixed amount to invest every single month is going to help you invest more easily and more efficiently over time. Okay. I think we have time for a couple questions in the comments. If you guys want to put them down here, I will read them um, and I will respond. Ooh. Okay. Somebody asked if I like to invest in crypto. And what I like to say is that, uh, yes, I personally do have some crypto investments, but there's certainly a teensy tiny fraction of my portfolio. Um, I wouldn't put anything in crypto that I'm not willing to lose. And it certainly isn't something that's going to be a large investment for me. I think there are so many other things that you should be investing in before crypto. So consider things like your employer sponsored retirement plan that's tax advantaged um, and buying just traditional investments in that to get that tax benefit. Um, You want to make sure that you are investing in your individual retirement account. You want to make sure that if you have an individual brokerage, you've put some money into that. Crypto is like way far down on the list and it's not something that I recommend as an investment class for most people. Somebody wants to know what is my toxic trait when it comes to my finances. Ooh, toxic trait. Okay, I have one. Um, I love to comparison shop. So if I want like a shirt or a sweater or something, I will look all over the web for four hours. It's horrific. Um, And then sometimes I don't even end up buying the thing. One thing I will say is that, uh, you know, Speaking of my wonderful partners at Marshalls who helped to make today possible, going to Marshalls is so easy because I know I'm getting a really great deal on what I'm buying while also still getting high quality designer stuff. Um, This sweater is from Marshalls, in fact. Look at how soft it is. Sorry, I'm like showing you guys my double chin, but look at how soft this looks. It's wonderful. Um, And it really did help save me a lot of time. So I would just say, um, you know, the... A, a paralysis by analysis thing, I was putting that on in my own life. Um, so I definitely don't recommend, you know, online shopping for four hours and not getting anything. Uh, but going to a place like Marshall's um, is really going to help you get a good deal while also looking really cute. Um, Do you have a favorite indicator while day trading? I actually don't day trade because... 85% of day traders lose money in the long term. And for all of my folks who are listening, please let, if you take anything away, let it be this. You want to invest for the long term. You want to be a buy and hold investor because that is going to pay off better over time than trying to time the market perfectly and buy the perfect investments. You want to have something that is very nice and stable and is going to take care of you in your old age. So I don't day trade. Okay. Oh man, you guys are typing a lot faster than I can read. Okay. Any good resources on how to diversify your Roth IRA? Um, So when it comes to diversifying your portfolio, I would say focus mostly on assets that are already diversified. So that might be a target date retirement fund because that's already going to be an entire basket of stuff. Um, You can look at sector funds that you might be interested in, but I would just say, make sure that you're not 
trying to cherry pick the perfect investment, that's going to be really challenging and likely isn't going to pay off in the best way. Um, okay, and we'll take, oop, we'll take one more question before I have to wrap. Okay. Um, oh, I like this new, this recent one. Okay. Thoughts on a CFP. So, uh, a certified financial planner, I think is a really great idea because it allows you to talk to a professional who can help you build out what your financial future is. People get these confused CFPs a lot with financial advisors. Typically, I find financial advisors charge very high fees and they want management fees for the money that they help you invest, and it's not worth it for the vast majority of people. However, with a CFP, a certified financial planner, it may actually be worth it because those are the folks that are actually going to be able to help you say, hey, this is where you're at, this is where your goal is, and they typically charge a fixed fee. So they're like, hey, to talk to us, it's going to cost X, Y, Z versus let us take a percentage of your portfolio. I just don't think that's a good idea. So CFP, I'm a big fan. Um, love it. Okay. So I see that we are at 640 and I was told that I should wrap this up in a couple minutes, but I do want to say Thank you so much for everyone for joining me and my partners at Marshalls for this amazing TikTok live to cap off Women's History Month. Um, I hope you can walk away knowing that you deserve the good stuff in your life and stuff like this that is going to support you on your financial journey so that you can live the life that you want, whatever that means to you. Uh, as always, investing does carry risk and you can lose money. So learning about finances is important and so is consulting with a financial professional if you're ever confused or have other questions. Um, Marshalls and I want to educate you. So please talk to a financial professional to understand the risks and learn more. As always, thank you again for spending this time with me and I hope to see you guys all again soon. For everybody who is asking if they can backtrack or if this is recorded, yes, we will be downloading this and Marshalls will be sharing this on their YouTube um, so that you guys can revert back and watch all of the Q&A as well as the little hot tips that I did at the front. So everybody, thank you so much for joining. I am so, so grateful that you've all spent this time with me. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday and uh, happy birthday to me because I turned 30 today. <laughs>